My name is Jackie Cabasso. I'm the executive director of the Western States Legal Foundation, which is a U.S. affiliate of the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms. I'm also a founding mother of the Abolition 2000 Global Network to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons, which is the, yes, that's appropriate, <laughs> which is the, the mother of the Peace and Planet Network, and I serve on the, the I'm one of the co-conveners of the Peace and Planet Network, and I'm also a national co-convener of United for Peace and Justice. So um, I'd like to uh, commend that first panel. That was just an excellent setup for our second panel, which I'm pretty excited about, which is called, it's called Nuclear Arms Causes, Effects, and Movements Against. And what we're going to do on this panel is to try to dig a little bit deeper to look not just at the common effects of all the oppressions that we've been talking about, and nuclear weapons, of course, but also what try to uncover the common causes. We don't spend much time doing that. I want to start out by just reading a short quote to just try to illustrate what I'm talking about. This is something Jonathan Shell said. Global warming and nuclear war are two different ways that humanity, having grown powerful through science, through production, through population growth, threatens to undo the natural underpinnings of humans and all other life. Now, we these days hear a lot of talk about the, the catastrophic consequences of a nuclear war involving 100 nuclear weapons, which would lead to dramatic climate cooling, famines, and potentially two billion deaths over the next 10 years. So that's a way we can see the common effects of nuclear weapons and climate change. But that doesn't address the common causes of nuclear weapons and climate change. And that's what this panel is going to begin to take a look at and in an even broader context than that. Sharon is an Israeli human rights and peace activist. She's the founder and director of the Israeli disarmament movement. In recent years, Sharon worked as a disarmament campaigner and as the director, the director of Greenpeace in Israel. With the Israeli disarmament movement, Sharon represents ICANN and other international disarmament organizations in Israel. And she also serves on the coordinating committee of the Abolition 2000 Global Network to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons. Please give a warm welcome to Sharon. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Jackie is also one of the reasons I managed to come here, because I was denied a visa to the US, but then Jackie sent them some letters that were very convincing, I guess. Um, I'll try to make some connections. We'll start with the NPT. The NPT is a treaty that was very important for many states for many, many years, saying on one hand, no proliferation on nuclear weapons. Those states allowed to continue and have nuclear weapons, but there's a commitment to disarm. And the third leg of the NPT says um, that they're encouraging, the big carrot is nuclear energy. Now, the NPT has stuck for many, many years in the same position. We are waiting for the nuclear armed states to say that they are willing to give a timeline to disarm, and it doesn't happen. Meanwhile, we can see what happens with nuclear energy, and yet nuclear energy is the big carrot. And in 1995, when the NPT came to kind of an end, or the end of its first period, because of the Arab states and the non-aligned movement, there was a decision made to um, have a nuclear free zone, nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. A great decision, but a hypocrite one, uh, because, and not the only hypocrite decision by the NPT, but a hypocrite decision by the NPT, because it's very nice to say that the Middle East will be nuclear free zone when the only nuclear uh, armed state, Israel, is not part of the NPT and therefore the decisions of the NPT has nothing to do with Israel uh, policies. The one good thing that happened from that is that there was a beginning of work towards um, a conference calling for a weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, meaning nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, 
and the means of delivery. Now that is a bit more progressive or better because if we're thinking not just how to bash Israel, which is a great sport, but how to bring Israel to the table, it needs to be something that Israel also has something to, um, to gain. Meaning not just that Israel gives up its nuclear, uh, chemical and biological um, arsenals, according to foreign sources, but also uh, Israel can have something to do or something to say about um, any chemical or biological programs that might be in other states. So that was the decision taken in 2010 and since then everybody met together, it was very nice, uh, they achieved nothing, they couldn't even agree on an agenda. Not the only forum in the world that couldn't achieve an agenda, but here again they the couldn't even achieve an agenda. Meanwhile, something much better happened. Civil society managed to bring states into what we are witnessing today, a nuclear ban treaty. And that's great. That's the best thing that we could have achieved. 10 years ago, people were laughing at us when we said that we will do it, right? It was a joke that we will bring the states to a nuclear ban negotiations. But not just that it's happening, it seems like it's a successful and civil society is in the room. But there's again one tiny, tiny, tiny problem. The nuclear armed states are not there. It's just a small problem. And like most problems, we will find a way to bring them because we're civil society, right? It's up to us. It's all up to us. So let's look at the nuclear armed states, what will bring them into the table, and what is the connection between this and uh, environment and peace. I will focus, of course, on the Middle East, but I'll explain why I'm focusing about on the whole Middle East and not just on Israel. We all know that the US will not disarm without Russia, right? It has to go together. We all know that India and Pakistan will have to do it together. What will Israel need? in order to bring Israel into the table. Israel not just need the rest of the world or the, next, the rest of the nuclear armed states to say yes, we're going for it. Israel needs a regional solution. Israel is a small state surrounded by Arab states and I'm not saying it to defend Israel, we can talk later about how horrible Israel is, but what, right now we want something from Israel, right? We want Israel to join these talks. So for Israel we need a regional solution. This regional solution could have been the talks. However, the talks so far have been, uh, been done only by state representative. The state representative of Israel and the state representative of the Arab states. And if you'll show me a state representative with goodwill, I'll be surprised because Israel would like to keep the, the monopoly right as it is. And the Arab states, they don't really care about the Israeli arsenal, but it's much nicer to be able to bash Israel and to call Israel to join the NPT and disarm with no conditions and so on, when they know that it's not going to happen. So not very responsible behavior by those who are supposed to keep us safe. So again, it's up to us, civil society. What we've done is we took all the obstacles that the state said that are there, all the reasons that they say that it's impossible that made it, make it impossible to come up with a regional treaty. And as civil society, we decided to write a treaty, a very comprehensive treaty, and to show the methods and the ways that this, uh, that this can happen. A WMD, Weapons of Mass Destruction, Free Zone in the Middle East. Now we are on the second stage. Now we are going to have round tables. The first one will be hosted by Scotland, hopefully in November. And when we bring experts from the Middle East to solve all the tiny problems that still exist with this treaty. But really tiny problems, like consensus. I said tiny, <laughs> but it is solvable. We are civil society, we are flexible, and we want to achieve it, so we will find it. Now let's talk about the Middle East. What's there now? Yes, Israel with, with weapons of mass destruction. You have ISIS in Syria with chemical weapons, but we have something even, even much worse, the NPT. Because the NPT promised states that will be part of the NPT help to get nuclear, um, nuclear reactors for energy, right? And states made believe 
or become to believe that having nuclear technology makes them more prestige. So at least four states in the Middle East now are looking or are in the first steps to build nuclear reactors in the Middle East. Now what is in the Middle East? Shortage of water, drinking water, wars, missiles, um, non-state actors, everything that takes nuclear uh, energy and makes it by far more dangerous. Not to mention that the Middle East does have a very strong need for energy. Very strong need for energy. So what we propose here is something that is much safer. We proposed that not just that these states, without peace first, will start sitting and negotiating on a treaty. They can take the treaty, they can change it, they can do whatever they like. It was just one proposal, one way. But what we propose is to start already bringing experts together. And what we also offer is to start collaborations on renewable energy, peaceful energy, energy that will not kill. It's like killing the equiper, the, the, um, the water underneath, right? That's what this nuclear energy will do. So what we offer is already to start with these talks and start the collaboration to build, collabor to build partnerships between states that already talk and what we offer is for these experts to sit together, make this much better, and we like other states and other international organizations to look at this, join us in our international meetings to make this one better, and try to uh, offer this to your own governments. Maybe they will adopt it, because we don't think that the Middle East states will adopt it first. So it's up to us, but it's also up to you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Vincent Intandi, the coordinator for history and political science and an associate professor of history at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus. He holds a BA in economics from SUNY Potsdam in 1997, an MA in history from SUNY Oswego in 2003, and a PhD in history from American University 2009. His research interests include African American history, 20th century United States history, social history, and nuclear studies. Vincent is the director of research for the American University's Nuclear Studies Institute and has proposed the Center for Black Studies at Montgomery College. His articles frequently appear in the Huffington Post and he is an author of what I think is a very important book, African Americans Against the Bomb, Nuclear Weapons, Colonialism, and the Black Freedom Movement, uh, published by Stanford Unity Press. Um, Vincent? I think we're good. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you. Thanks for being here. It's nice to see everybody dry and our clothes all dry after yesterday. Um, thinking about what I want to talk about today um, and all the work that I do in DC, and at the same time, I wear multiple hats, so I'm directing a new institute for race and justice at my school. I work with UCS, Peace Action, and, and so on and so forth. And one thing that always comes up is the word intersectionality. This has now become kind of the buzzword in a lot of these movements of how things are interrelated. And that, in a sense, is even how this book came about in my own career. For so long in my own career, my life revolved around civil rights, the black freedom movement, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, atomic weapons, nuclear disarmament really wasn't on my radar until 2005 when I first went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Meeting with atomic bomb survivors, especially Koko Kondo, um, Koko Tenemoto Kondo, hit me so hard that I then knew I had to combine these two passions of mine, eliminating racism and eliminating nuclear weapons, and that's what led to this research uh, in this book. And I say that because the idea of intersectionality or movements being interrelated is not new. Um, and this was especially the case in the black community. When the atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima and then in Nagasaki, many in the black community, of course nothing's monolithic, but many in the black community immediately came out and connected the issue of nuclear weapons to their own struggle for freedom and equality, to race, to colonialism, to economics. In fact, it was Langston Hughes, who in 1945, the great black poet and writer, who was one of the first in our country to come out and question Truman's own racism in the decision to use nuclear weapons, and of course he was right to do so. Truman 
isn't the most racist president, we probably have that now, but one of the most racist presidents in U.S. history. Um, the great Paul Robeson, who so many of, our, of my students have no idea who he is, it's tragic, but Paul Robeson, a year after the atomic bomb was dropped in Madison Square Garden, speaking to 20,000 people, he was one of the first to come out and tie this issue to colonialism, asking the question of where did the United States get our uranium? to make nuclear weapons, and the answer, of course, was the Belgian-controlled Congo and Africa. W.E.B. Du Bois, who had by then already was lionized in Japan, uh, was also a vehement critic of Truman's decision. And a lot of the early critiques that we see in the black community was because there was a connection with the non-white world, something very important because we're lacking that in many cases today that in many in the black community, they identified with the Japanese. They identified with non-white people around the world. Remember, it was the Japanese who came out publicly and said they were gonna to come to Ethiopia's aid when Mussolini said he was going to invade and the US was gonna do nothing. There were many in the black community that saw Japanese internment in this country and said, here's a group of people that committed no crime but were being put in concentration camps simply because of the color of their skin. This could happen to us. So part of this was already built in before the atomic bomb even happened. When there was the hydrogen bomb in 1952 created and there were threats of using it um, in Korea, again in the black community, they were looking at this saying, no, we are not gonna let another Hiroshima happen to non-white peoples around the world. We see it again in the 1960s, of course, when we repeatedly threatened to use nuclear weapons in Vietnam, again, non-white peoples. And in the 1950s, uh, there's so many things happening at the same time where you can see these connections happening. Right? Especially in a pivotal year like 1955, where in the summer you have the heinous murder of Emmett Till. A few months later, in December, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on the bus. But in that same year, we had the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, the first all African-Asian conference. And if you look at that platform, they were very clear that they were against white supremacy, colonialism, and nuclear weapons. At the same time, in the late 1950s, we see the French government wanting to be a world power and announcing they were going to test their first nuclear weapon. Where? In Africa, in the Sahara. You have uh, Algeria going through the revolutionary movement. You have Ghana and Nkrumah gaining independence. And the people in Ghana worried about the nuclear fallout from that French test. So who was it that put that together and started that movement to try to stop the French? It was Bayard Rustin. Rustin, who had such a long body of activism in this country dating back to the 30s, another person forgotten, marginalized because he was gay. In the 1960s, it was not just Vietnam, but we of course see Martin Luther King Jr. and all of his statements as triple evils connecting these issues. And where did he learn so much of this from? His wife, of course, Coretta, a long seasoned activist dating back to her days at Antioch College. It was King who was saying, what does it matter if we're integrating lunch counters and then not caring about the world in which we're trying to integrate? Don't you see how these things are connected? And of course, this lasts into the 70s and the 80s. And I'm a historian that doesn't believe in just studying history and leaving in the past. What, what good is that? If you're not gonna study it and see how it can apply today, how can it reach students today? So the new book I'm writing now is on the June 12, 1982 march. How? How did we get one million people together without a cell phone, without social media? What was done right? What was done wrong? How did they organize? How did this happen? And as I'm doing the research now in the interviews, I'm seeing some of the same themes that are happening, some of the same problems that happened today. We, we saw that they had to fight back then. And this issue of intersectionality was there. Yes, there were some that said it should be a single issue. We should only focus on nuclear disarmament. But there were others, many others, including some in this very room that said, how? How, when we look at the issue in Lebanon right now, when we look at the Reagan administration killing 75,000 in El Salvador with death squads, how can we not tie this together with what is happening with nuclear weapons? These issues are indeed connected. Now, one thing, uh, the reason I wrote the, the first book was because right now, where I teach at Montgomery College, um, we're one of the most diverse schools in the country. And half of my, in my classes, about 50% of my students are from all various parts of Africa, Ghana, Ethiopia, Nigeria. 49% are African-American from the DC area, 1% other. 
And what I see is a huge disconnect between my African and African American students. My African students tell me that when they come here, they are taught not to associate with African Americans, that they are lazy, they droop their pants, they're not one of you. My African American students will say, I'm not from Africa, I'm from Anacostia, I'm from Shaw, I'm from Southeast DC. And trying to explain to them when the cops killed Philando Castile, they didn't stop first and say, are you from Anacostia, Nigeria? They killed him because he was black. And how these things are related. And we're starting to see that in certain aspects, right? We're starting to see now Black Lives Matter activists standing at Standing Rock. We're starting to see them stand with one another with Palestine or with Dreamers. But still nuclear disarmament isn't there. Still peace is not there. It's, it's like the, the stepchild, the person left out of intersectionality. And why is that? What is it that we should be doing better? What can we do better? And that's what I'm looking at more and more today in this research and working um, with, with students today, working whether it's with Black Lives Matter or with peace groups and nuclear disarmament. And we have to be honest with ourselves, you know, being in DC, I'm, I'm privy to a lot of the problems that we saw back in the 80s and that we still see and are some ways worse today. And what I mean by that is there's a real disconnect right now between arms control and nuclear disarmament. We have to be honest, there's some people in the arms control movement that have a nice paycheck right now, and it's not in their best interest for us to have nuclear disarmament. And the tragedy is they're the ones that have the purse strings. They're the ones that have the money. And in many cases, it intersects with patriarchy. We have to be honest with ourselves that in a lot of this movement, there is still dominated by white men. And women are still fighting for a seat at the table. People of color are still fighting for a seat at the table, and most of all, millennials are fighting for a seat at that table. I am amazed every day at what somebody like Kate Alexander does for peace action on a shoestring budget. Imagine what she would do if she had the money that some of these larger think tanks have to really organize students. This young female just came up here from Tufts. Imagine what she could do with real resources. This is something that we have to address and we have to look at. We have to think about how can we reach these groups? How do we build coalitions of Black Lives Matter? Half of the battle is just showing up, just listening, right? And if they see that we're constantly there, then they'll be there for us, seeing how these things are interconnected. You know, the first book I wrote is because I'm hoping that if white peace activists that didn't know African Americans were interested in this, pick up my book, they'll see the connections and vice versa. That my African American students, when they'll see that Huey Newton and Angela Davis and Malcolm and so many others that they look up to actually cared about nuclear weapons, they'll get invested in it. And so, you know, in closing, yes, we are fighting on a lot of fronts, and that's a problem for a lot of my students. They're trying to put food on the table, pay student loans, hope to God they don't get killed by the police on the way home from school. And to them, nuclear weapons is still abstract. They've grown up with war. They were three, two years old when 9-11 happened. They don't know a world without it. And so they're just trying to survive. And so we have to work to see how can we get them to care about this issue. Is it that we need to rebrand peace, right? Um, and make them realize that peace isn't weak? Do we have to show how it's connected, nuclear testing and environmental racism? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. And so in closing is, yes, we have to fight for LGBT rights, we have to fight for women's rights, we have to fight for Black Lives Matter, for Native Americans. But as Dr. King said, what does it matter if we achieve social justice if we're all dead from nuclear war? And now, now is, the, now is when we capitalize it, not just because of nuclear ban, but because we have two people right now, two racists, two white nationalist authoritarians with 90% of the world's nuclear weapons in Putin and in Trump. There is no, and then you have over 130 countries that are mostly non-white in the UN trying to ban the bomb. There's no bigger connection of race and nuclear weapons than right now. And so we need to do, thank you. And so let me just say that when we step back and we look at intersectionality and we look at all of these movements, we'll realize how so many people before us did, most notably Malcolm X who probably understood it best that for all of us and all of these different movements, the issue is, was, and remains truly so that all of us have universal human rights. Thank you. I just want to remind us that the title of this conference is One Struggle, Many Fronts. No nukes, no war, no walls, no warming. And so our final speaker on this panel is my colleague, Andrew Lichterman. 
He is a policy analyst and lawyer with the Western States Legal Foundation in Oakland. As a lawyer, he has represented peace and environmental activists in a variety of settings and also taught at alternative law schools for many years. In recent years, his work has focused on the purposes and impacts of U.S. nuclear and other strategic weapons programs, including their effect on global disarmament efforts and on the relationship between nuclear technologies, militarism, and the global economy. He's a member of the board of the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms, the Coordinating Committee of United for Peace and Justice, and the Global Council of Abolition. So, Andy. Well, that uh, quote that Jackie read from is actually from a little leaflet we put together on uh, the relationship between nuclear weapons and climate change. And it was paired up with another quote, which was one from Lewis Mumford in 1970. Is the association of inordinate power and productivity with equally inordinate violence and destruction a purely accidental one? And I think the speakers in our, our first panel uh, eloquently provided us the answer to that question. And I would also note that in 1970, Mumford was writing from within the context of deep, sustained, and diverse social movements, the, the kind of moment that um, Vincent was describing, and I'll come back to that theme uh, later today. So a number of us who are here now uh, had an interesting discussion in Vienna uh, at the NPT preparatory committee meetings about obstacles and opportunities for disarmament. And I'm, I'm going to try to continue that theme a little bit there in the context of how we might forge connections with other emerging move movements and also at the same time to provide some background for this afternoon's last panel, which will look at what comes next after a ban treaty has been negotiated. And my thoughts, of course, are very strongly influenced by my experience here in the United States, but conditions in the United States also, unfortunately, still play a disproportionate role due to its place at the apex of the global economy and the global war system. Now, the ban treaty effort together with the conferences on humanitarian impacts that preceded it, constitutes an important affirmation of the norms against nuclear weapons possession and use. These initiatives raised awareness in a new generation of activists of the catastrophic effects of nuclear warfare. If a ban treaty is successfully negotiated, which appears likely, it will provide new ways for nuclear weapons-free governments to exert pressure on the nuclear armed states. And it also could provide new opportunities for raising public awareness about the dangers that nuclear weapons pose. But so far, the, the humanitarian conferences on the effects of nuclear weapons and the ban treaty process have not sparked mass movements for disarmament in the nuclear armed states or their leading allies. And the main obstacles uh, for disarmament, as uh, Sharon noted are unsurprisingly the intransigence of those nuclear armed states sustained by the inertia of their entangled antagonisms and the economic and political power of their military industrial complexes. And it's important to keep in mind that a convention banning nuclear weapons will bind only the countries that join it. And so far these, these nuclear armed states and their allies have stood strongly in opposition. But Almost half the world's population lives in nuclear-armed countries. These countries account for over half of the world's gross domestic product. Add the six leading countries that have military alliances with the nuclear-armed United States, Germany, Italy, Canada, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and you have over half the world's population, accounting for 70% of global GDP. And in an era of renewed and more multipolar and complex great power competitions, the leading militaries now claim a variety of roles for their nuclear weapons. The nuclear armed military industrial complexes, having survived their own post-Cold War ideological crisis, have helped to sustain a highly inequitable global circulation of trade and investment and constitute a significant source of profit and a center of economic and political power within it. So again, if a convention is negotiated, which it most likely will be, it can provide us a new tool to um, work for nuclear weapons abolition. But 
it can be no stronger than the hands that wield it. And for there to be substantial progress towards nuclear abolition, we will need mass movements in the nuclear armed countries. Large scale opposition here in the United States is likely to come about only as a part of a broader peace movement, one that, as many people have commented today, can work together with other emerging movements by focusing on the common causes of the dangers and injustices they seek to end. A renewed effort to understand and explain the dynamics driving the growing risk of war among nuclear armed countries in this movement is a, an essential starting point. It's the path to starting to make the connections to other issues, from wealth and income inequality to the damage wrought to the environment by an economy dependent on endless competition and endless material growth. Now, amidst a generally grim political landscape, there are some glimpses now of how things might be able to move in this direction. We seem to be coming out of a period of about three decades of low social mobilization. This period has been characterized by also what Vincent was talking about, single issue, professionalized, interest group advocacy style politics. Times of low social mobilization lead to a kind of self-reinforcing stagnation. Low rates of political involvement uh, tend towards the proliferation of these single issue organizations, employing professionals who use conventional campaigning techniques and litigation. <clears throat> Conventional professionals focus on effects rather than causes, offering incremental technical, legal, and short-term political fixes for the problems that do the dominant order of things systematically generates. Proposing any policy change that would significantly affect the current distribution of wealth and power lies beyond the ambit of the reasonable and the fundable professional course of activity. And in times of low social mobilization, proposals that would require fundamental social change do appear unreasonable as only deep, broad, sustained social movements can change the boundaries of what is politically possible. And, you know, in this respect, the Ban Treaty is interesting to think about because it may be close to the outer limits of what you can do in disarmament work in a time of low social mobilization. It developed an international network of NGOs employing skilled and dedicated campaigners with the um, support of some friendly governments. It helped to spark a series of high profile international conferences on the consequences of nuclear, nuclear warfare. But notably, these conferences focused mainly on the effects of nuclear weapons and not on the causes of continued high tech militarism and renewed confrontations among nuclear armed powers. <coughs> Give me a moment, I'm fighting a bit of a bug here, so it's keeping my voice going is a bit of a struggle. Now, this kind of approach was sufficient to gain the backings of governments in nuclear weapons free countries. But without a far broader basis for social support, it's stream, extremely difficult to make real disarmament progress in countries where nuclear weapons play a systemic role in military policies, national security ideologies, and increasingly insular, top tier national economies. Now, in retrospect, we can see that the Ban Treaty Initiative uh, started in a very different moment. The episodic waves of resistance sparked by the global crisis of 2007 to 2008 and the distinctly inhumane response of most of the Western governments mostly still lay in the future. So too did the accelerated ten accelerating tensions among the nuclear armed great powers, particularly the renewed confrontations in Northeast Asia and in Europe, although some already were warning then of that danger. But as recently as 2012, President Obama and many of the leading arms controllers could with a straight face rank the acquisition of nuclear weapons by terrorists as a greater threat to humanity than the civilization destroying arsenals of the nuclear armed states. Now, since that time, waves of resistance have coalesced into the collapse of the established political alignment and party structures 
of several of the Western nuclear-armed countries. The first to take advantage of this interregnum have been authoritarian nationalist for forces, privileging a single, usually racist, ra racial and uh, uh, religious vision of what the nation is and who is a legitimate member of that nation. So our starting point for making common cause with the movements for a more democratic, fair, and ecologically sustainable global society will be understanding the relationship between these developments, the rising risk of war among nuclear armed states, the ascendance of these authoritarian nationalisms, and the deepening discontent engendered worldwide by the accelerating polarization of wealth and income. <clears throat> and although the initial beneficiary of this interregnum has been these authoritarian nationalist forces, their rise is also a marker of a return to higher levels of social mobilization. And by stoking resistance across the rest of society, they likely also have helped to accelerate it. Now, again, in times of high social mobilization, such as that, that Vincent was describing, um, these great waves of movements that gained momentum in the late 1950s here in the US and then subsided in the 80s, the connections among issues and struggles are easier to see. The mass movements of such times provide the independent spaces and social and material to support, to explore and develop them. And the best thinkers of such moments could distill these connections with an admirable clarity. Now, I'm about to read one of my favorite uh, lesser known Martin Luther King quotes. And I want to do a little exercise, sort of pull back for a moment. And, you know, I'm doing my best, but contrast the density and complexity of the kind of discussion, and I'm not saying that in a good sense, I'm saying that in a bad sense, of my discussion with the clarity of the way that King makes these connections. Now, of course, one always compares one's own words with <coughs> Dr. King's at one's own peril. But I think it helps to contrast the difficulty of understanding our murky moment from where we're sitting um, to how one can understand their moment from long immersion within the perspective of broad and sustained social movements. So in 1967, Dr. King told us that we must honestly face the fact that the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring of the whole of American society. And he went on to say, a nation that will keep people in slavery for 244 years will thingify them, make them things. Therefore, they will exploit them and poor people generally economically. And a nation that will exploit economically will have foreign investments and everything else and will have to use its military to protect them. All of these problems are tied together. If we are to, to create the broad movements that might make disarmament possible, we must be able to explain that nuclear weapons are neither a Cold War anachronism nor an inexplicable aberration. They are not an effect without a cause, but rather the ultimate expression of a system heedless of our place in nature and in which the few profit from endless competition and conflict while all the world bears the risk.
and she is going to say a few words and she will be translated by Takashi Kikuchi. Uh, they are from Jensuiken, which is a big anti nuclear group in Japan who've been organizing for decades around this issue. It is such an honor to have them here today. I will have to speak with My name is Tadako Kawazoe. I come from Nagasaki City. I am a Hibakusha. Uh, when I was an uh, atomic bomb, I was just one year old. So I have little memory, direct memory about bomb. Uh, grow up uh, through uh, my mother and my relatives told me about what happened uh, in Nagasaki. On the 9th August 1945, Nagasaki was born. Uh, next day, 10th August, her family evacuated from Nagasaki city to about 25 kilometers from the city. Because the, 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 my, her mother uh, holding her and go through the city, which almost burned out. There are so many uh, burned bodies on the street. Also, horse burned out. Just the house still stand. There are so many refugees from Nagasaki City marching to outside of the Nagasaki City together with their family. Four family, uh, she, including her and her mother, was very sick. After the bombing. She and her mother just survived. She never forgave the nuclear weapons because she heard a lot of uh, stories about what happened on the 9th August, what the nuclear uh, weapons did. She is very pleased that uh, nuclear weapon ban treaty is now in reach. This is the New York City Police Department. You are unlawfully blocking the entrance to this building and obstructing pedestrian traffic. You are ordered to disperse now to permit the safe flow of pedestrian traffic. If you do so voluntarily, no charges will be placed against you. If you refuse to disperse, you will be placed under arrest this and charged with disorderly conduct. This is the New York City Police Department. Pedestrian traffic. 
You are ordered to disperse now to permit the safe flow of pedestrian traffic. If you do so voluntarily, no charges will be placed against you. If you refuse to disperse, you will be placed under arrest and charged with disorderly conduct. This is the New York City Police Department. You are unlawfully blocking the entrance to this building and obstructing pedestrian traffic. You are ordered to disperse now to permit the safe flow of pedestrian traffic. If you do so voluntarily, no charges will be placed against you. If you refuse to disperse, you will be placed under arrest and charged with disorderly conduct. This is the New York City Police Department. You are unlawfully blocking the entrance to this building and obstructing pedestrian traffic. You are ordered to disperse now to permit the safe flow of pedestrian traffic. If you do so voluntarily, no charges will be placed against you. If you refuse to disperse, you will be placed under arrest and charged with disorderly conduct. This is the New York City Police Department. You are unlawfully blocking the entrance to this building and obstructing pedestrian traffic. You are ordered to disperse now to permit the safe flow of pedestrian traffic. If you do so voluntarily, no charges will be placed against you. If you refuse to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct or transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct.
Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorder. Accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, if you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to disperse, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and refuse to disperse, you will be...